Hi class, we're back. Um, I hope everyone's doing well and that you're um, starting to get the hang of our online transition. Um, again, just as a reminder, you're working on your rough drafts this week, so get it done. Um, and don't like kind of get it done, but like for real though, get it done. Some of you on SA1, it was a beautiful job. Others of you, whoo, sheesh. You really need to do well on SA2, right? So maybe we'll dedicate a little bit more time to the drafting process instead of waiting until, I don't know, 11 o'clock Saturday night to finish writing our rough draft. Let's do it 11.59, okay? Uh, anyway, uh, I'm done with my grumpy professor feedback now. Um, and just as a reminder that because 1020 is more a survey of critical thought as opposed to learning so much the mechanics of writing, our class has been very discussion heavy. So what I've done in order to maintain that like essence of discussion is I've invited three community members to participate in our lectures. And we will be discussing the literature that you are reading, right? So hopefully it feels like people are with you. Hopefully, well, hopefully it doesn't feel like people are with you because that's creepy, but hopefully you feel less isolated during this horrific time of social distancing. Um, and yeah, so I'm gonna have everybody go around the room and introduce themselves, um, talk about you know who you are, what you do, what your favorite thing to read is, and um, if you could have, if you had $1,200 put in your bank account for no reason other than like the economy is tanking, what would you do with that $1,200? So I'll go first. Hi, oh my God. My name's Rob, Professor Robin Lee Lear. Um, my favorite thing to read right now, I'm never going to have a favorite thing to read, but I've been reading a lot of um, Robert Bly poetry, actually. Um, so I think I'm really digging Robert Bly right now. Uh, I'm a professor, and if I had $1,200 magically placed into my bank account because the economy was failing, I would invest in a small business, small local business. Right. It's a very moral answer. <laughs> okay, so we'll just go around next. Uh, hi, I am Sean Choquette. I am um, a high school history teacher in Nashville. I like to read, well, things about history. But I like to really, I don't know, besides that, um, Hmm. I like to read interesting stories about like different types of women, like fiction, but doing things that usually society doesn't picture them doing. Like the serial killer book? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that would tell, really the, awesome. tell the class the title of the serial killer book. <laughs> it's you called just My Sister the Serial Killer. All right. All right. Next. Oh, wait. I didn't do the 12. Oh, sorry. $1,200. $1,200. Um, I would probably pay off a credit card. Amen. Another moral answer. <laughs> okay, next. Um, what's up, everyone? I am Chris Brown. I am. I work in healthcare IT by by day and by night. I do hip hop music. Um, what was the next one? Favorite thing to read right now? Mm -hmm. Favorite thing to read right now actually is. Uh, is is lyrics i've been spending a lot of time on genius.com reading uh lyrics from the jail electronica album um that just came out recently uh and the thing about genius that i like is it's different people it's kind of like a you know, community generated or whatever it's people saying like how they interpret lyrics so i like to compare how i interpret lyrics to how other people do it that's why i usually go to genius for my my lyrics when i'm researching those, those kinds of things but anyways and then um if I had $1,200, if I had $1,200 put into my, well, actually, I can tell you exactly, I know what I want to do with it. I want to put it in a credit union. 
Oh, another moral wise yeah. decision. Savings, savings yeah. credit union, did the old car refinance. Can you dig it? <laughs> so <laughs> just really quickly, you like to read discussion boards on lyrics where the community is having a discussion. Well, so so what it is is they <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait. Like what we're doing today. Oh, I see yeah. what you did there. Oh. I see what you did there. <laughs> So maybe like this could be enjoyable class, <laughs> like a podcast, like a podcast, right? Podcasts are awesome. Okay, next. Um, I'm Lance Humenhofer. I am an MBA student, and I own a small book publishing company, which is a small business that. <laughs> If some of you received twelve hundred dollars, <laughs> okay, 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 <laughs> you can go to. <laughs> uh, no, we, um, yeah. So, um, my favorite thing to read always is Southern literature, and that'll probably never change. Um, and with twelve hundred dollars, I had the most time out of everybody and i don't know yet <laughs> i will say i'm pretty fortunate that i don't have to put it toward rent or utilities hmm. so i think um i don't know i think it needs some more thought right now beautiful all right well today i mean we're like we're well into our um our <coughs> our social distancing now and I think everybody's starting to get a little stir crazy and maybe we're starting to become a little bit anxiety ridden. Um, and so I thought that by this time in our class, it might be nice if we read <coughs> something about relaxing or more, right? Because Sleep by Brian Lennon is an essay from a collection where he's writing stories about his perspective on New York City. Um, and so what he's doing is he's looking at New York as it's sleeping. Uh, and so right now we're definitely seeing that when you drive around Nashville, probably for the first time in my life. I remember that when I was like, uh, when I was a freshman in, in college, something I used to love to do was to be out driving um, at around, I think it's 11 o'clock. And so I like to, I used to like to just drive into the middle of nowhere, um, be driving the middle of like the city, not the middle of nowhere at around 10 45 PM. And then my favorite thing that would happen would be when the, when the, when the lights all of a sudden change from stop, stop lights to <coughs> the flashing caution or to the red light, the blinking red light. Um, and so I, that's a lot of, lot of how I perceive or how I read this essay by by Lennon. Um, so let's go in. Let's get in. Dive in to the wreck, right? Though classified as creative nonfiction, City is an open genre piece that reads with the rhythm and beauty of poetry, despite its sometimes philosophical core, occasionally pausing to ponder Kierkegaard dilemmas it maintains linguistic grace and self-reflexivity. City is a unique and unmatched experimental work by an emerging and sophisticated writer who is paving exciting new aesthetic and theoretical roads. Under the ground of the self, too, there is a system, lanterns and signs spelling out something. What? Regret, ambition, hope despair, wreckage and splintering boredom, and other more happier modes and tropes. For the other, Mimenix con constructs a, comp a composite surface image, Hart's photograph. In this picture, boxy yellow taxis glide serenely through the midday autumn mist. A theater marquee, right center is missing letters, yellow light floods, through the glass doors into the pavement. A figure stands there pondering. The marquee is pitched slightly over her head. The film is entitled Sleep. 
So what do you get out of this passage, crew? Quarantine crew? <laughs> Under the ground of the self, too, there is a system. Lanterns and signs spelling out something. What? Regret, ambition, hope, despair, wreckage and splintering and boredom. That's definitely sitting with me a lot this week. Mm -hmm. Um. Because again, right, what do we what do we get when we are still? What do we experience in stillness? Anyone? Um, thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you're forced yeah. To sit with your thoughts. Yeah. And you um we sometimes we, we busy ourselves so much so that we can almost like run away from those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um and so here we're looking under the ground of the self, there is a system. And it's in this like moment of stillness when we're seeing the city, city calm down, when we're city, seeing the world begin to like embrace pause, when all these thoughts flood into us because there's nothing to distract us, right? And we all, we all find modes of distraction um, some of us, uh, some of us work 60 hours a week because we're crazy and because we want to run away from those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Some of us participate in consuming things that might not be that good for us because it stops us from having the flood of those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Some of us, I don't know, like what are some modes that, that maybe y'all do now that we've been had to be still, that helps sort of silence the, this, the, these ideas. I don't know. I guess I haven't had I haven't had uh, too hard of a time transitioning. From, oh, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. I, I was saying I guess I haven't had too hard of a time transitioning into uh, I guess kind of like the new paradigm that we're living in because I because I I grew up an only child, I was used to like entertaining myself. And so that was an exercise that I actually would do all the time without even realizing it. I would just, I would just be sitting and chilling and, and kind of uh, reflecting on my own, my own thoughts, kind of looking inward. So um, it's kind of interesting hearing y'all talk about how, like, like the different mechanisms that y'all use to kind of, kind of cope with that because it, it always kind of came naturally to me. I'm definitely somebody that I would argue spends a lot of time in their own head. And I'm definitely like always trying to work out how it is that I'm feeling. But I think that for me, the, like the biggest shift has been the lack of community. Mm. Right. That like sometimes when I'm upset or sometimes when I'm really happy or um, sometimes when I just like, experience something that I feel like I need to share. So that's that's something that I'm having to kind of reconcile with is that now I can't just drive over and share this. Now I can't spend time with those people. Instead, I just have to like allow that safety and that distance in order to feel better secure. And also to feel secure in that those relationships are, are able to be sustained over this period. I love that he starts off too with talking about all these like really negative things, right? Despair, wreckage, splintering, boredom. And then how does he, he visits the happier things he just mentions and other have more happier modes and tropes. Why? And what is that doing? What part? The second part. Maybe you need to sit closer so you can see. Uh, and other more happier modes and tropes, right? So that that's how he addresses things that are happy, right? To be repetitive. Why? Because those things are just like not real, maybe? Are they not real? 
or they're not like in, as important. <sighs> I think you're getting close. <laughs> I think you're getting very close, right? I'm gonna show it. Do we have a tendency to dwell on what makes us unhappy? Yeah. Yeah, right? Uh, I had a really good friend one time point out because he suffered from depression that he has to sometimes question his joy because he doesn't know if that joy is just as high because he's come out of a dark place, right? But we don't ever think about when we're happy. We're just, we're in the moment. We're happy. We're living. And it's when we get into this like darker area when we begin to be a little bit more self-reflective because we're questioning why are we feeling that way? So we visit happiness quickly and then we move on. Mm -hmm. Surface image, hearts photograph. Is this picture boxy yellow taxis glide serenely through the midday autumn mist? A theater marquee right center is missing letters. Yellow light floods through the glass doors into the pavement. A figure stands there pondering. The marquee is pitched slightly over her head. The film is entitled Sleep. That's like a beautiful it's, scene yeah. that we constructed right there. Yeah. And it is like we're setting it up like this is, so this is our first passage. And now we're knowing what we're getting into. And when we look at how it's laid out on the page too, right, that there's just these paragraphs and then we quit and then there's all this blank space on all the pages because what we're looking at is just the rest. We're not looking at the busyness. And so I think that there's a lot to be said in the construction of his essay. But here we go, right? We embrace sleep. And so that's what we're going to begin to look at is the negative, like the negative aspect of this time period or this time being given, and also the more beautiful moments, but maybe the beauty doesn't outweigh the negative because we have a tendency to focus on that. The mystery of lives recursively in how many ways, a near infinity of ghosts, concentration of the city. In the hour between three and 4 a.m., when it breathes in an equilibrium of surge and repose, you can hear something like the footsteps of the dead. Isn't between three and four the witching hour? 12 and three. Yeah, oh, it's 12 and three. That would be cool though. Yeah. So this is New York City, you mm -hmm. said? Mm -hmm. They call New York City the city that never sleeps. Yeah. Does that come into play here at all? Yeah. It's not true, though. Well, a couple of weeks. <laughs> no. I've had experiences trying to get find some place to be at 3 in the morning in New York. I did not find it. <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's true and it's not true, right? Like, here. And this is something that we're... That, I specifically didn't introduce as much to you about this essay before we started, because I think part of what Lennon is wanting us to do is learn how to just appreciate the beauty of a passage, right? That it, there's a luxury in just reading some of the scenes that he's constructing, mm -hmm. which we see in the first one, mm -hmm. but the mystery of lives, Cursively, in how many ways, a near infinity of ghosts, concentration of the city. In mm. the hour between 3 and 4 a.m., when it breathes in an equilibrium of surge and repose, you can hear something like the footsteps of the dead. Interesting. Why? Well, he says, the mystery of lives, recursively, in how many waves, mm -hmm. a near infinity of ghosts, concentration on the city. So the city is New York City, right? Mm -hmm. A concentration of people. So the people, the population, the people of the city are just these waves of people. Yeah. They're just drones. They're they're infinity of ghosts. They don't have this they they don't have an individual right now. It's just like yeah. a mass of yeah. people just living in the city, doing and their everyday thing. We're kind of looking at them at, in the place of time as the ebb and flow, mm -hmm. right? So it's between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. Well, that's when people start waking know, up. 
yeah, people will get up and be pair, prepared to go to work. And mm-hmm. so it's just like, it's like that first wave. Dead. Yeah. The but then you wave. also have the first wave is the, where's the first wave in the second? Because at 3 a.m. is also when people have a tendency to start turning down. Yeah. And so there is like this, this flux in mm-hmm. and out that we're seeing that the city's going through. So yeah. it's a transitional time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this actually <clears throat> this reminds me of a Lyft driver I had one time. He told me Friday and Saturday nights, he stays awake till like 6 a.m. Because he was saying until 3 a.m., I mean, you're driving people to bars. And right about 3.30 is when everybody starts waking up to get taken to the airport. And so he just works all the way through. Mm-hmm. And he's out there till 6, 7 in the morning. Yeah. And it's interesting, the waves would probably correspond with the type of person you are. Like, oh, yeah. you know, like people that are always going to the airport, or maybe the businessmen, mm-hmm. you know, people coming back from the bar at 3.30 are going to be the yeah. younger party hip yeah. crowd, you know? So mm-hmm. it's like they are, the time is very important in distinguishing who is there at that moment. Yeah, and yet also, it's also, it is in an equilibrium of surge and repose. Yeah, coming and going. Yeah, but you're also very similar because it's it's at that peak of either you're done or you're beginning. Uh-huh. And so that sense of exhaustion is still present too, right? That it is mm-hmm. the essence of sleep, but we're never going to get to have sleep. Cool. Good job, guys. All right. We're getting with it, right? We had to wake <laughs> up. We've been sleepy. Perhaps the city it all it perhaps the city always erasing and being erased renders the notion of origin absurd. Mm. And yet there is a sanity that sticks it to place, as we know when we recall the apartments and restaurants, the parks, the park benches, the public telephones, long since reclaimed by others that once were accessories <laughs> of our own. Oh wow. Yeah, this one's cool. What are you liking about it? Well, he's saying, like, renders the notion of origin absurd. So it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? It doesn't matter. <laughs> and yet, you, we recall the apartments, the park benches, telephones that we once had that are now committed. So it's like, these people are doing the same thing I just did, but in a different time. Like, yeah. how different are we? We're probably, I don't know. Perhaps it's always the city is always moving. erasing and being erased. Yeah. That that the concept of like permanence is never mm-hmm. really there, right? Because we're always we're always interacting with the same things, right? I think too it's cool that he uses uh public benches, right? Park benches and public telephones. Uh and telephones kind of dates the play the piece, right? Because ain't nobody using a tel- uh, public telephone anymore. But park benches, we know that there's a very particular person mm-hmm. that reclaims the park bench at night. Yeah. Which is the destitute. Mm-hmm. And then the people during the day reclaim the park bench. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there is like in a way these like things that we interact with they also unite us mm-hmm. across socioeconomic position yeah <clears throat> be good with this one we want to keep mm-hmm. going no, okay that was kind of oh no don't freeze mm-hmm. come on laptop oh no no <laughs> Okay, well, I'm just going to take that as a sign (laughs) that we were supposed to move on, right? Okay, Uh, so we're going to begin, right? We're transitioning out of sleep by um, Brian Lennon. And, you know, the the Internet God showed our class grace by skipping our last slide. (laughs) Rude. Okay, um, and so now we're actually going to listen as Lance reads the Hollow Men out loud to us in his very best T.S. Eliot impression. <clears throat> yes, this is going to be old T.S. Eliot impression. Oh, yes, mm, gritty. The Hollow Men. Mr. Kurtz, he dead. 
a penny for the old guy. <clears throat> One. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together. Headpiece filled with straw. Alas. Our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass or rat's feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. Two, eyes I dare not meet in dreams, in death's dream kingdom. These do not appear. There, the eyes of sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging, and voices are in the wind singing, more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, cross staves in a field, behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom. Three, this is the dead land. This is cactus land. Here are stone images, are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in death's other kingdom, waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss form prayers to broken stone? For the eyes are not here, there are no eyes here, in this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on this beach of the tomb and river, sightless unless the eyes reappear as a perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom the hope only of empty men. Five. Here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act falls a shadow, for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is. Life is. For thine is the. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful reading. Stop, Thank you. Uh, so we begin with uh, Mr. Coates, he did a penny for the old guy, right? So that is the, the epigraph to this poem. So the first thing we begin with is The Heart of Darkness um, by Joseph Conrad, right, which is sort of the quintessential modernist text. And Mr. Kutz is the hollow man. Now, I'm also going to introduce two ways to read Eliot. The first way that you can read Eliot is you can go through and you can annotate every single classical reference that he's making. Um, or you can appreciate Eliot as a work of art, right? So that's the way that I like to read Eliot. It's that I like to appreciate it for the emotional beauty of it, not to brag about how well read I am. Um, but quickly, you know, A Penny for the Old Guy, that's a reference to Guy Fawkes Day, 
But I think he's also using it very specifically here because there's a lot of different references to the river to the river Styx throughout the poem. I think this too could be a reference to the coins that we place on the dead's eyes mm -hmm. as they transition after life. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna look at one and five today very closely. And so I challenge you class to maybe, you know, try and see what you can do with two through four by yourselves, okay? So we are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, alas. What is the hollow men? Who are the hollow men? The drones. The working class. Maybe. Yeah, the drones, the working class. I don't know. I feel like there's no right or wrong answer for this poem because I think you can look at it in a bunch of different perspectives and find meaning. Mm -hmm. I think your student's best course of action is to figure out what it means to them. Yeah. You know, Definitely. I think that's, you know, Elliot gets a lot of, <clears throat> gets a lot of criticism and that kind of thing. But um, especially this poem, I think um, kind of this poem will transcend all time, you yeah. know, and you have to realize that. Yeah. Um, so I think I've read something how it was about the working class in the 20s. Yep. Oh, is that, I was about yeah. to ask, when was this written? Yeah. So he's modernist. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. I think it was the time uh, when factories were starting to come up. Well, it's the time, it was actually, no, the factories <laughs> are more 1800. So with 20s, it'd be more like we are the hollow men that, um, well, like overconsumption became a thing, you know? Yeah, modernists are skeptical of industrialization. Yeah, that too. It's reactionary to that. So you're both. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, factories, like the assembly lines became a thing. And yeah. And it became more like a, a robot as opposed to. A human. A human, like they're just, they, they don't even make the product anymore. They just make one thing on the product. So yeah. it's even that more de detached from like actual art or an accomplishment you're just a robot yeah just doing the same thing over and over again all day yeah the drill i think this too um so he writes the hollow men in reaction to uh, oh, what is it what's the greatest poem ever written wasteland he writes the and it's not the greatest poem ever written right but uh, he writes this poem <laughs> after the wasteland so he's actually redefining concepts that le were left undefined by the wasteland mm -hmm. in the hollow men. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's a drone, it's the working man. It's he, uh, I always think of Thoreau because I love Thoreau and I'm just always thinking about Thoreau, right? That, mm -hmm. uh, that we, you know, that that's the man that's lost himself to the machine. Uh, I definitely also see it too as, um, as a modern interpretation, right? That, that, it's sort of that that loss, that sort of sense of loss, because that's what a good poem does. It transcends time. Mm -hmm. I think it also is a very direct reference to trench war. Mm -hmm. So that's head leaning together, mm -hmm. headpiece filled with straw, right? That we're we're looking at men in the trench. But then we have this like weird alas. And so I love the way that Lance read it because it's also the way that I always hear it read is that a lot of times we think, alas, mm -hmm. but it's not that mm -hmm. kind of alas. This is an uh, alas. It's a, it's a cry. Mm -hmm. It's a weeping. Um, and then we see again and again and again our dry voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless. Uh, we are the hollow men. Like that is just how you can look at modernism. That'd be like a reference to you know, talking. <clears throat> you are talking about like the waves of people coming, like coming yeah. and going. Uh, um, whisper. So it's like when they're they're communicating together. It's it's still 
quiet and meaningless. Like yeah. They're, they're this big mass, but it's still, you know. We could even say it's the coagulate. Well, I, was, I was thinking of uh, Pink Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the wall. The wall. The wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I um, interject some business? Yeah. History? So in the 20s was the very first time anybody asked themselves, like from a management perspective, what motivates people to do better work? Or how can, mm -hmm. how can you get your current workers you have to do more work? Mm -hmm. And in the 1920s, um, Frederick Taylor um, came up with now it was called Taylorism, which a very first thought of this was uh, you pay people more. <laughs> you give people more money, they do more work for you. They do better work for you. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what kind of, that kind of stuck around from like the 20s to like almost the 40s before someone, they started to realize <coughs> that that's not the only thing. In yeah. fact, today, that's actually it's irrelevant. The only time money is relevant is if you aren't paying people enough to where they're struggling to put food on the table. Oh, but it's actually found now that if people have the ability to live comfortably, no more money is going to affect the actual work that they put out. Right. So it's actually just a small piece of the pie. But if you look at it from that, like we are the hollow men, these people on these factory lines, they have a job and they, they're not, they don't feel like satisfied. They mm -hmm. don't, they don't like see the value in them doing like, you know, putting the tire on the Model T every yeah. day, you know? <laughs> and um, actually it's also been proven in motivational theories that um, like as far as jobs go, if you show people, like, if they do have a menial job, if you, like, ensure that they understand how that certain part really is, like, important to the Model T and it couldn't function without it, and they can see, like, the bigger picture of them, you know, putting on the tire or the carburetor, whatever they're doing, um, they actually feel um, they have more efficacy in their job, so they feel... Uh, like there's a meaning. Like there's meaning, mm -hmm. and they and they feel more fulfilled putting mm -hmm. that one piece in the Model T every day. Oh, yeah. But that wasn't around when T. S. Eliot wrote this. Yeah. So those workers that are going in the factory, and they're just get, they're throwing money at them, thinking that's going to solve everything. Um, it did. Yeah. What is the the jungle written? It's so uh, right around this time. It it's it uh, early. Oh, yeah. that's right. Yes, yeah, yeah. progressive, but. Um, but that's, it's the same problems. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't get a lot of the stuff that comes and fixes a lot of the, in, the problems that the, so, uh, industrialization made mm -hmm. like child labor and working conditions mm -hmm. and, um, all that stuff, horrible stuff. Yeah. And so like we can also, I mean, again, I always, I see so many things from, the perspective of the transcendentalists, right? Like, it's just, we are losing our connection to the work that we're doing. We're losing our sense of soul, our sense of purpose, our sense of self, mm -hmm. and we're lost. And everything that we create is barren. Our I voices... think it's absolutely still poignant today with how mm -hmm. electronic everything has gotten mm -hmm. in the world. There's such that distance yeah. between between affecting the world and then not thinking about it anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody's connected. Yeah. And that imposes a whole bunch more issues with people. The one word that keeps popping out to me is we are the stuffed men. Yeah. Because yeah, they're filling themselves. Like you're stuffed with what? Yeah. Like that's what yeah. I was kind of talking about the twenties, yeah. the overconsumption of liquor and things like and that. Like and the, the great Gatsby the thing. Scarce Scarecrow yeah. and Wizard of Oz. Yeah, they're kind of like the image yeah. you get. Yep, yeah, filled with straw. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. they were stuffing themselves with everything, but they're but still, they're still hollow. Yeah. Hollow. Yeah. Yes, because yeah. 
it's crazy that you can say you're hollow but stuffed at the same time. Oh yeah. And if we go back to what we were talking yeah, about well. with sleep, like mm -hmm. we've been stuffing ourselves with methods of avoiding this, the like confronting that. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. What were you going to say, Chris? I didn't mean to oh, cut you off. No, no, no. It's all good. Uh, I was just saying, you know, we're talking about the hollow man and the stuffed man. It's, those are the first two lines of the poem. So it's like, it, it kind of very deliberately calls attention to that. So it's interesting that you pointed it out. Yeah. Good, good job looking at form. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Listen to all these business majors <laughs> realizing how important it is to read poetry. <laughs> Sheesh. Um, something I want to point out too is that we get to this like space in between a lot. And Elliot, and we're gonna look at this again in the fifth section, right? Shape without form. It's a juxtaposition. We can never be shape without form. Shade without color. Paralyzed force. Gesture without motion. So there's this desire to have impact. There's this desire to assert oneself around or assert oneself or to exist within, but they can never make it to this point. Right, because mm -hmm. we're the gesture without motion. So the gesture would be just popping up in your head, then. Yeah, if it even thought. is really there, it's like yeah. this, like sort of. I think of it as like an unconscious rumbling, right? Like there's the feeling that I should be present. There's the feeling that I should care. There's the feeling that I should have purpose, but I'm not even really aware of it because I'm just the hollow man. Elliot's a neo, uh, not a neoclassicist, he's a classicist in that he's always wanting it to be like it was before, which is interesting for modernists. Uh, he's a Catholic, so we see a lot of religious references being made throughout. But those who have crossed without direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us if at all. So he's literally looking and he's saying that past generation Remember us, if at all, when we die, when we pass to death's other kingdom. Now, there's two kingdoms in Elliot, but we're in death's other kingdom here. Not as lost, violent souls. Because, again, we're in reaction to World War I. We're in reaction to uh, a global pandemic mm -hmm. and its sickness. Mm -hmm. We're in reaction to sort of having to deal with our own brokenness, our own emptiness. Um, and the violence that man is capable of, right? Mm -hmm. Don't remember us as that, but remember us as being too empty to stand in its way. Because we're hollow. Remember us, that as if, uh, remember us, if at all, not as lost violent souls, but as the hollow men, mm -hmm. the stuffed men. We could say stuffed could, in a way, be ignorant because I'm filling myself with the dialogue that I want to hear and I'm ignoring the atrocities that are happening around me. Really cool connection to like social media and mm -hmm. yeah, to our current society. I've been teaching modernism since this happened, so it's, it's kind of freaking me out. Mm -hmm. uh, two, Eyes I dare not meet, right? Because he doesn't want anyone to see his eyes because he doesn't want everyone to perceive his emptiness. This is the dead land. Again, we're back to that like barren landscape that can't produce anything because we're hollow. And then, okay, five. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear, five o'clock in the morning. <sighs> Here we go round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Here we go round the mulberry bush at five o'clock in the morning. What is he doing in this passage? He's using illusion. Okay. He's conjuring images of children. Yeah. Was he just conjuring images of children? He's definitely using images to to bring out the sense of 
childlike innocence. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, thousand percent, yes. What else could he be doing? <coughs> Is there a significance to the mulberry bush? Why he changed it? You mean? No, to the actual original one. Is that the one about the plague? No, that's a, a ring around the rosy. Ring around the rosy class, just so that you know. This is like a, a fun fact for when you're at parties. Is about the plague, right? Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy. Ring around the rosy, you'd get rings on your skin. Pocket full of posy, you smelled really bad because it would, your skin would pustule, pustulate and decay. So you'd fill your pocket's with things that smell good, pocket full of posy, ashes, ashes. We burned all the bodies of the plague. Yeah. We all <laughs> fall down. Yay. We all did. <laughs> so that's an interesting parallel, though, because we sing that to children, right? So in a way, we are indoctrinating you since you were born to repeat these mantras of emptiness, and you never really even perceive what they mean. What is prick the pear? He changes uh, it. Go ahead. It's like a desert plant. Yeah. Mm. It's like a cactus, okay. sort of. But he creates also the alliteration with the prickly pear, mm -hmm. and then there's also a sense of danger that well, we're getting there. This is the cactus land. This is the dead, dead land. Mm -hmm. So you're a hollow man. You live in oh, the yeah. desert in a hollow mm -hmm. land. That makes sense. You're running around the prickly pear because yeah. I don't know. It's kind of like it's there's almost no like, real life and fruit. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of waking up at five o'clock in the morning and taking trips around the prickly pear all day and coming home and stuffing yourself again or whatever you gotta <laughs> do, you know. Well, yeah. the prickly pear could be what he was talking. Oh wait, no. Never mind. <laughs> I was thinking about sleep. <laughs> well, I think that uh, I think Brian Lennon is getting at a lot of this in his essay, right? That like we're trying to that it's here at this moment of stillness when we become most aware of these like strange connections of our city and here we're always avoiding that mm -hmm. that that feeling and then we get into it right and you know again this poem i'd rate it like pg-13 because it gets a little sexy <laughs> not yet but we're coming mm -hmm. back to that like juxtaposition again right between the idea and the reality <clears throat> between the motion and the act falls the shadow. So it's between the, it's between the inception of anything, right? Between the idea and the reality, mm -hmm. between the motion and the act falls the shadow, falls the emptiness. And then we begin to pray for thine is the kingdom. We, we're either seeking salvation in this passage or we're worshiping our emptiness. We're worshiping the shadow. Between the conception and the creation, this is where it gets a little sexy now, so stay with me. Between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long. Uh, we have that anxiety, right? We have the anxiety of, of our emptiness. And we're wanting to hearken back to a time when we weren't aware of that emptiness. We're like, oh God. Uh, Elliot wants to return to the past, right? Maybe when his faith subsided the anxiety when we were more innocent than we were. Well, but now we're praying for salvation, but we're also, life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, whoo, sheesh. That's, we're getting but we're getting a little bit spicy here. Oh, spasm! Ooh. Between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent, upon your very creation, when you enter this worm, 
rid of this worm. This worm. Oh, oh. Sorry. Mm. Right. That's where the shadow fell. Can we, you know, I know what the essence in the descent is, Dion. You heard that before? Mm-mm. I don't know the philosopher. A pretty, yeah. pretty old philosopher. It's pretty similar. I don't know if you guys know, like Plato's Forms. You ever heard of that? Okay, well, basically, um, or the allegory of the cave. I've uh-huh. heard that. Okay, so that's like Plato's form. So this kind of plays off that. So basically, there's somewhere exists the exact perfect form of a tree. And then everything you perceive in the world is is derived from that tree, but none of it is that perfect form because it can't be perfect in this world. So that's parallel to whoever came up with the essence in the descent. So the essence is this perfect ideal of something. Mm -hmm. So somebody's true essence or, um, you know, like water's true essence exists. There is a, that that exists, but we live in the descent Mm. so our physical world is the i mean bastardized essence of stuff so that it is yeah so that we experience the descent because nothing in our world is perfect but it's the between right it's between it where's the shadow it's the same thing with like the emotion and the response Mm -hmm. because i mean if you think about it like sometimes you get very emotional about something and you respond to something right away. There's not much time in between feeling some way and responding to it. Yeah. So all these the, things are just very quick. The brokenness exists. And there's like that, the brokenness. Yeah. So I think that, that to me out of all of those, that one, the essence and the descent, um, that for me gives me more clarity to what he's trying to get at than any of the other ones. Yeah, but, for me, it's also it's that like we can never come out of it because it, it's with us from our very conception until we die. Yeah. <laughs> Falls the shadow. the shadow. What's the yeah. shadow, though? It's so scary. What's the shadow? It's you know, those things that, you know, in ghosts that comes and gets the, the, no. the ghost <laughs> and not. drags it to hell, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the black clubs that you can only see. On the road, have you seen that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ghost, Patrick's crazy. Children oh, who are listening, you should <laughs> go. It's dog. it's an '80s movie, so no, it's '92, I think. '92, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Right. So yeah. They got born that year. Uh, the uh, hearing Lance to explain this. This might be a little bit of a stretch, but I'm gonna go for it. Hearing Lance explain the between the essence and the descent makes me think of the rig and morty where they have all their toxins purged oh yeah no that yeah. is yeah oh yeah. and they're the between yeah. because yeah. they're not the descent they're yeah, not the they're law. not like yeah, their toxins are the shadow <laughs> yeah, yeah their toxins are the shadow yeah, yeah. that's really interesting okay that's a reference y'all should know come on watch rick and morty if you have <laughs> yeah. i did that yeah I did, I did that for the uh, for, for the- patrick swayze reference <laughs> <laughs> I did that to me. <laughs> <laughs> That one aged us. Yeah, it did. yeah. You showed our you showed, you showed too much of the playbook. <laughs> for thine is the kingdom, and for thine is life. Is we're worshiping or we're acknowledging or worshiping both is how I read it. For thine is the. I yeah, just so feel like almost he can't say it again. Yeah. Like that to me looks like someone who just can't say kingdom anymore because. Maybe the the shadow has overtaken, or he's struggling to get out the word kingdom there. Well, for me, it's you like, know? for me, it's the anxiety that this isn't there. Well, because it goes for thine is, and he's not saying the kingdom, and what life is long, right? So you're saying yeah, it's not yeah, long. Right. Yeah, like maybe he's ask, dying. Yeah. No, no, he. That, that he would seek death. Yeah, go to the Life genius. is very long. Yes. There's a there's a desire to, again, if we're if we're hollow, if we're empty, and if life is meaningless, and we are not creating a sense of meaning, 
through anything that we do, life is very long. Uh, what life. is there to live for? Uh, yeah. Purposeless. It's purposeless. Yeah, it's empty. Oh, I know that. For thine is, life is, for thine is the, this is the way the world is. It's like he gave up. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and like, not with a bang. We want it to be like a yeah. huge explosion. Yeah. Like this is, how does the world end? It's through our own apathy. Yeah. It's through our own hollow. emptiness. <sighs> Sorry, class. This is the second time I've made a video lecture about this poem, and I like can't stay on it anymore. <laughs> right? Can we consider T.S. Eliot's and this is this is what your one of your free writing exercises for this week should be. So you need to time this for five minutes and add this to your journal, right? But can we consider Eliot's poem from a modern perspective? Well, obviously you can. We've been doing that for the past like I don't know how long. Uh, <laughs> is it relevant today? Hmm. Could we argue that it is more relevant today than in the in the past? So what I want you to do for your free writing example this week is to write on these questions. And now I'm a merciful professor, so I'm not leaving you drenched in the empty, in the lost. This is Waking from Sleep by Robert Bly. Inside the veins there are I'm actually, I'm not going to read this today. I'm going to ask Ms. Choquette to read this for us. Okay. All right. Inside the veins, there are navies setting forth, tiny explosions at the water lines, and seagulls weaving in the wind of the salty flood. It is the morning. The country has slept the whole winter. Window seats were covered with fur skins. The yard was full of stiff dogs and hands that clumsily held heavy books. Now we wake and rise from bread and eat breakfast. Shouts rise from the harbor of the blood, mist and mass rising, the knock of wooden tackle in the sunlight. Now we sing and do tiny dances on the kitchen floor. Our whole body is like a harbor at dawn. We know that our master has left us for the day. All right, so obviously we're sort of like grounding ourselves. We're waking from sleep, right? We're becoming aware. We're coming into our own. And so we're looking at the body inside the veins. There are navies setting forth, tiny explosions of the water lines and the seagulls we weaving in the wind of salty blood. It is morning. The country has slept a whole winter. So we're coming out of this, right? Out of hibernation. Out of hibernation, out of ooh, maybe something more, right? Window seats were covered with fur skins. The yard was full of stiff dogs and hands that clumsily held heavy books. We're becoming alive again. Mm -hmm. We're becoming aware again. We're grounding ourselves in the metaphor of the body, right? The body is coming alive again, coming aware again. And then it gets really weird. And that's what I want us to talk about today because like, oh my God, it's like too weird for me to figure out alone. <laughs> now we wake and rise from bed and eat breakfast. Shouts rise from the harbor of the blood, mist and mass rising in the wooden tackle in the sunlight. Now we're singing and we do tiny dances. And I love that, do tiny dances. I love, it reminds me of my mom. Oh, that's cute, yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of my husband. Aww. <laughs> do tiny dances on the kitchen floor. Our whole body is like a harbor at dawn. We know that our master has left us for the day. The hell is the master. Sleep. You're fully awake. Oh. Do we think that? That's what I was thinking. Shouts rise from the harbor of the know. blood. 
Maybe. When I was, <laughs> this is how I, I thought. He might have been. Like From a, a dog. dog's perspective, oh. I don't think that's true. <laughs> but, yeah. this, I, you that know, this is weird, masters. but Harbor, like, this is what I've, this could be completely wrong, but it's like, I picture like a uh, person, but I'm thinking like it's like a, because I keep saying we, mm -hmm. something like family. Oh. Oh, He's yeah. with his family. Now he wake and wake and rise from bed and eat breakfast. Shouts rise from the harbor of the blood. When I think of that, it's not something weird. I, I'm thinking like your your blood, like your family, like mm -hmm. your family's like saying, "Hey, come eat breakfast," or "Let's go do this for the day." Uh, yeah, and the then the blood. you know now we sing and do tiny dances. We're just socializing with your family, and then we're oh, we're up. Like our master. Sleep, we're completely awake. Hmm. That's what I'm saying. That's just the scene. I, I can buy that. What do, you, <laughs> what do you think, Chris? Um, I don't know. I was getting hung up on the harbor of the blood thing. I had no, I had no idea how to interpret that. So it was interesting to hear. Sean's take what on line it, are we on? Uh, the third stanza. Okay. Shouts rise from the harbor of the okay. blood. Making sure I use the correct terminology. No. Great job, great job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and then I, I just noticed he makes another harbor reference. There's a lot of different, like water lines. Yeah. That's a, uh, the seagulls weaving. Navies. Salty blood navies. There's a lot of shipyard sort of. Mm -hmm. jargon happening of stiff dogs and hands from clumsy held heavy books that clumsily held heavy books I what do you think Bill? I always read this as a waking up of ig from ignorance yeah I don't know you're coming out of that like that hollow state and what better image to use a sense of hollow than the Navy. Why? Why is the Navy hollow? I mean, why do I use a picture of the military when I teach Thoreau? Because you're taught never to question and only to obey orders. Even when it goes against your own sense of morality. So for me, that's how I've always read it, right? And then it's a, it's a true awakening, not a learned awakening. And hands that that and hands that clumsily held heavy books. Now we wake and rise from bed and eat breakfast. We're nourishing the body. Shouts rise from the harbor of the blood. It's like it's permeating up out of us. It's becoming true. Mists and mass rising, the knock of wooden tackle in sunlight. Now we sing and do tiny dances on the kitchen floor. Our whole body is like a harbor at dawn. We know that our master has left us for the day. I think that there's, and again, that's why I love poetry. Because I think that there, that's what makes poetry so beautiful. One time I taught a poem called Valentine. And it's about a young woman. It's shaped like half a heart. It's called Concrete Poetry. It's about a... Uh, uh, this is about a speaker visiting the grave of a past lover. And I always read it as a past lover, but I have had several students read it as the loss of a parent. And then I had another friend of mine read it as an Ars Poetic poem, a poem about the act of writing a poem. <laughs> and so I'm saying all of this as we transition out of this week so that you can see and you can feel freed by the beauty of what poetry can do. And that's that poetry has multiple meanings, right? And so we're not bound by one. Sean reads it as a family. I read it as a coming into consciousness, conscious awareness. Lance reads it as a dog. For a brief second, <laughs> the master threw me. You know, I, I knew it wasn't written during like slavery times because 1962, I don't know. 
what the author's ethnicity is, so I wasn't sure if that was in play, but I don't know. I don't know either, and that's what's <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Ten minute in class journal prompt. This is your last in class journal prompt, children. Don't forget about the one that was in the middle. You have been tossing and turning all night and you can't seem to go to sleep. You go over to your desk and begin writing your insomniac thoughts in a stream of consciousness style. Detail that account and everything that's gone on around you. So, thank you. We've had a wonderful class together. I look forward to reading your paper proposals. And yeah, maybe part of this insomniac writing will also become your rough draft, which is due when, class? Saturday. Saturday. One more time. Saturday. Saturday. Yay. Get your homework done. Okay. Love you. Bye.